Acunetics helps thousands of organizations secure their websites and web applications across the globe. Whether you're a one-person team ensuring the security of a few websites or a large organization interested in automating your web vulnerability assessment and management, Acunetics is here to help. Hi everyone, I'm Veronica, I'm otherwise known as V. I want to talk to you guys today about something that's very close to my heart. The little beauty that you see here on your screen is actually my device. It is one that I got in January. Today I want to talk to you about falling water. My opinion, my approach to medical device vulnerability disclosure. So who am I? Well, I started my life out as a cyborg. I was a goon for DEF CON, I still am. I believe I'm a hacker, a builder, and a protector. I am now an assistant professor at Norwalk University. I also closely work with a manufacturer dealing with cardiac devices in the US. So why is this talk so important to me? I spent the last nine months speaking to engineers, whether it be hardware, whether it be software, firmware, or security trying to discuss with them what they feel their constraints are, what their pitfalls are, what their opinions are. I have listened to understand that three years ago, I did not know when I said that dealing with vulnerabilities should be quicker, what actually went into it. But more so, I was reminded in January that a medical device will and can save your lives. Medical devices are important. Medical devices are needed. Their core functionality is, after all, to give medical treatment to those that need it. I always very much believe that the process of designing medical devices are beautiful and staggering, and it has evolved from years ago. We are seeing that, that more treatment options are available to patients. We've seen advancements in dealing with chronic illnesses, but more importantly, every new device that it's designed saves a life. So inevitably, we have an extension of our lives. If I think about myself, I wouldn't be here without my device. In fact, I would have not achieved or done everything that I've done without having this piece of hardware and software running my heart. I wanted to cover some terminology that we will use in this space, specifically the SOC, because these are things that if you are in the medical device manufacturing world, you know. MDM is how we refer to a medical device manufacturer. For me, a medical device is a device that was designed and manufactured to be connected to a patient to give medical help, medical assistance or clinical, clinical diagnosis. A clinical device? Well, that for me is where it gets a little bit different. These are the endpoints that are connected to a medical device or a device containing clinical data of a patient. Then we have the electronic healthcare records, otherwise known as the EHR. We have pre-market, post-market, placing on market, and these are all processes we go through in manufacturing to actually bring our devices to market. Then we have something which I am very passionate about, which is called post-market surveillance. Now, albeit I don't love the word surveillance and I prefer monitoring, this enables us to have eyes on the prize and know when our devices start malfunctioning. Some of these are very confusing and they haven't been standardized. So you will hear people using it very differently. For my talk, this is how I will be using it. Now, there's no such thing as a non-vulnerable device. Now I know, sit back, relax. Let me explain. Today we design a device. We've tested it, we've checked it, and it's not been vulnerable. But we need to understand that the lifespan of these devices are not just for a year or two. They are for 10. Take into consideration an implantable or ICD device. That device will last in a patient between 10 and 17 years. Because we cannot design with future in mind, meaning that 
we can't predispose or have a magic ball that will tell us what will become vulnerable in the coming years. We need to understand that we need to be adaptable and take on board that there's no such thing as a non-vulnerable device. Just like there is no, th no such thing as an unhackable system, at one point in its lifetime, it will be vulnerable. It's not so much the fact that it is vulnerable, but how you handle that vulnerability, how you deal with that process. And this is what I'm hoping to highlight today, that we need to move away from having an idea that we will never have vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities will forever, when you are building, be part of what you do. So let's discuss this further. There's no safety guarantees when building medical devices. Today, the device can be safe. Tomorrow, it may not be. It is a risk management issue. You need to determine what the risk management appetite of your organization is. Don't even get me started on the risk management for patients. That is a conversation for another day. We need to know that everything we do closely and aligns with how effective the device is and how the device performs. If I ask you functionally what a medical device should do, you will all agree that it is there to give medical treatment. It's a medical device after all. We need to consider the lifespan. These devices last for years. You want to talk legacy? You want to talk technical debt? Let's have a discussion about medical devices. These are problems that faces a manufacturer that man manufacturers face every time. But there needs to be a shared responsibility among stakeholders. As much as the manufacturers build these devices, it's up to the whole community to keep them protected. So let's discuss the waterfall approach. Now, I want to caveat this first. I spent the last nine months working very closely together with developers and you know, engineers and security people within MDMs. I wanted to understand how they built these devices. I'm a big geek. I love the fact that I have this piece of technology that is so simple but so complex that I needed to understand how it was built. And the one thing that I realized is that we are designing for hardware. And some of them make use of a standard waterfall approach. Some make use of a combination. But I wanted to understand how devices are built. I wanted to know more. I am not a developer. I'm a forensics person that wanted to learn how device building works. The general waterfall approach has an analysis phase. We have a design phase. We have an implementation phase, a testing phase, deployment and maintenance. What's important to note here is that everything is done within a silo. One phase has to finish for the next to start. So let's consider why waterfall is still used when building for embedded implanted hardware. I want to stress that this is specifically aimed at dealing with ICDs, implantables, and pacemakers. They are still developing for hardware. The hardware lasts for many years. In my case, my new device will last if I use it at a minimum for 17 years. They're not always as updatable and, and even just doing a RAMware update could have detrimental effects on the patient. This is connected to a patient in the most intimate form and way. At some point, the code will be vulnerable if it isn't already. So how does it work? Well, for one process to start, the previous one had to finish. There's more of a linear and logical separation of phases. So can we translate this? So let's translate it. We have to do a feasibility study. Is 
is it feasible for us to build this device? Will we have patients that need the device? Then we move on to the design phase. The design phase is where we put down our requirements. We start with system specifications. We start with hardware. We start with battery and sensors. We get to firmware, we get to security. But each requirement is detailed right in the beginning of it. Then we move into our developmental phase where we start building the hardware, we start building the sensors, we do the batteries and we do the firmware. But what we need to realize is the extent of what we need to verify, because this device is going to go into a human being. It's gonna be connected to someone's flesh and blood heart. There needs to be 100% verification across everything that you are doing. And it has to always pass. It can't fail fast. It needs to be functional. So when I say fail fast, I mean that the functionalities that it offers can never be questioned. The algorithms used need to have the correct treatment response. Once we've verified and gone through our testing, this is all validated. And only then will the design be transferred into a conceptual product. And even then, it still gets tested again. As you can see, building medical devices are not as straightforward as I thought a couple of years ago. I am happy that I spent the time learning how this was done because I appreciate my own device so much more. Now, another thing that I realized is that depending on the country that you're in, depends on the regulatory considerations. For the purpose of this talk, I didn't focus on a specific country and I tried to go on regulations that are used globally. Every country has different regulatory considerations. But what we need to realize is for an MDM to bring anything to market in that country, it needs to not only adhere to global standards or considerations for regulations, but it needs to do the local ones as well. For example, you have the FDA in South Africa has their own. So we look at the ISO 1348 85, which is a quality management system for medical devices. We have ISO 2417, medical devices information, which needs to be supplied by the manufacturer. We have ISO 14971, application risk management for medical devices. We will talk a lot about risk management in this conversation, because I've realized when we deal with vulnerabilities, we are doing risk management. We have IEC 62304-2006, which is the medical device software um, standard. It deals with the software lifecycle processes. It makes mention of how software for medical devices should be built, what the requirements are, and specifically deals with medical device software. This is probably the one that I have read the most and I found to be exceptionally comprehensive. I'm not going to be mentioning all of them because I have probably five pages full. I wanted to highlight the ones that I have seen used across the board the most. But the idea here is not to talk about regulations or tell you about the considerations, but to say to you that it is more complex than just putting together a device. There are many facets that go into building these devices. We have the NEMA guidance. The Manufacturer Disclosure Statement. We have IEC TR 8001, Application of Risk Management for IT Networks. We have NIST standards and so forth. There are regulatory considerations globally for medical devices. Now, this is probably the one that made me the most excited. I got to see the unit testing as well as the functional testing of a device. And what I realized was that some of these tests that even are aut automated take so long. They're so comprehensive. They have to have a 100% pass, meaning that if we have a function that has multiple variables, all those variables need to be 100% tested and they need to pass 100% of the time. Again, there's no room for failure. When I say failure, I mean the functional failure. We've seen devices 
grow old. We've seen devices become vulnerable. But these are just the natural progression of dealing with software and dealing with hardware. The testing process that these devices go through are rigorous. They are also awesomely interesting. Sitting and watching specific functions that I know I, my device has made me realize that even though the innards or the guts of the device look simple, the firmware contained on it is astronomically complex. And I sat back and thought to myself that if we now make changes and we have to test this again, how is it dealt with? How do we deal with the vulnerabilities? A couple of years ago, I said vulnerabilities should be dealt with fast and ferociously. But I realized that that was playing it fast and playing it loose. When we deal with medical devices, any changes we make have a real world impact and they need to be rigorous, rigorously tested. So now we get to dealing with vulnerabilities. Now, I don't want to say I've been fortunate, but I feel that my experiences as a patient have led me to look at the world differently. In these last three years, I have grown to understand that vulnerabilities are something I will be faced with every day, whether it be my physical vulnerabilities, whether it be my software or hardware. And I will take you through that a little later. I asked the question, we have responsible vulnerability disclosure pro programs. We have all of that. But what happens when a vulnerability is disclosed? And I had conversations and I wanted to understand how it's dealt with. And I came, came to the realization that if I didn't know, perhaps anyone else didn't know. So let's have a look at it. We've done our system definition, we've designed our product, we've implemented it, we've tested and validated it, and we've gone to market. And then comes the most tricky part. We have to maintain the integrity of that device. But now a vulnerability is disclosed. Now my question is, do we start right at the beginning? Well, yes, we kind of do because it has to go through the same process again. We can't make changes to a device without ensuring the safety of the patient, but more so the integrity and the functionality of the changes we bring. Also, it gets pretty tricky to start changing hardware. It's one thing dealing with a flaw in the vulnerability, but a whole different ball game when a device is implanted into someone and now you have a hardware problem. So, I've heard comments made that why can't we deal with medical devices the way that Microsoft, Amazon, Google deals with their devices? Well, it is a bit more complex than that. Now, my question is, is 30 days enough? Is 30 days enough to complete the whole cycle and have a fresh RAMware update or new software update for you to run? Well, it kind of depends. Now, that is the simple answer. Now, I'm going to ask you this, right? 30 days seems plausible to have a conversation and have a notification that there is a vulnerability. But having a solution in that time might be hard. And the reason being that we have to go through multiple steps to ensure that when we are dealing with vulnerabilities, we don't break something. How many developers out there have had to fix a bug and then ended up introducing vulnerabilities and extra problems within their code, if not inevitably break it. Now, imagine working on something that is implanted in someone. Someone that's looking up to you and trusting you to not break their device. So it depends. It depends on the manufacturer's willingness to engage the researcher. It depends on the researcher's comprehensive findings. It depends on the problem that's been found. So my easy answer to that is it depends. And it is a technical and forensic term we often use when doing cases. So, okay, 
we've not confirmed that there is a vulnerability. Now, there's a picture of Dolbit that comes to mind screaming, help, help, help. Well, not necessarily. But we need to, this is an important step. We need to confirm that it's indeed a vulnerability. Now, again, I'm not saying that it's exploitable. I simply said that there's something that's vulnerable. Now, do we test it again? If we are expected to functionally test everything and do unit testing for everything and have it passed 100% of the time, should we then be testing whether something's exploitable? It is kind of an important step, I would say. Because would we deal with the vulnerability that is, that is just a vulnerability that is not exploitable? No, certainly not. I'm pretty sure in the software that you design or hardware that you build, if it's simply vulnerable but not exploitable, you won't spend the extra manpower to fix it. Certainly when something becomes exploitable, we start seeing an increase in risk. So how do we ass assess the severity? Well, there is something that's used in the industry. We have negligible. Okay, so it's minor inconvenience or a temporary discomfort. We have minor, which results in an injury or impairment, but it doesn't really require a doctor to help you. We have serious, okay? This is where a doctor needs to intervene. Critical, this could result in a permanent impairment or life-threatening injury. And catastrophic is the thing we never want to have happen, and that results in a patient's death. Now, I need to ask you a big question. Do we fix all the vulnerabilities? Do we fix all the bugs? Do we fix everything? This may be difficult to determine the impact on patient safety. It gets even more so complicated when the device is implanted. Also, a vulnerability might not be exploitable. Often in IT security, we push for integrity and confidentiality, but in medical devices, we need to push more for availability. Would you rather have a device that is so secure that it no longer becomes available, no longer functions as a medical device? Because now its core functionality is to be secure. It also depends on the device. It is much easier updating a home monitor or even the patient bedside monitor, an infusion pump, than it is to deal with embedded implanted devices. There is certainly not one, you know, one easy, one size fits all solution. I kind of wish there was, because I'd have a lot less work to do. Now, this is a very personal story of mine. Last year, November, I first had an issue with the firmware of my device, which we managed to do a RAMWARE update for. However, what we did not realize was that the leads connected to my device malfunctioned. I now had a hardware issue. I spent months trying to convince my doctor that the device was indeed lying to him, that the device was wrong, that the device was not correct. I was resuscitated twice November, December due to my device not giving me the life-saving therapy I so needed. Now you ask me what happened. Well, my leads were in from my previous pacemaker. This is device number two. I lovingly call her Lilith. Due to that, the device was not able to sense the electrical activity within my heart. Meaning according to the device, all was well, but my hardware failed. There was a vulnerability now not an exploitable one, but one that caused a severe and critical risk to me. How did I solve that problem? Well, it's easy for me. I am an e-patient. I'm very involved in the technology that goes into my body. I was able to pull on my forensic experience and I dumped the data off my Apple Health Kit. I used Python to script it out and understand what was happening in my heart. I then took the data from my pacemaker and compared it and could show the doctors and fight for it that there was a discrepancy. I raised the vulnerability with them 
that now needed to be investigated. And we had to do our own testing. And in January, after a fight with my insurance, I received new leads, new device, and a new lease on life. This is a very personal journey to me, but this is just the difference between not having the energy to get up versus the energy to get up. Now let's discuss what vulnerabilities and you know what a vulnerability is and how they are dealt with. Well, I as a researcher now found a vulnerability. What do I do now? Most medical manufacturers have a disclosure program you need to go to. Is it going to be easy? Probably not. The conversations lead to be difficult. Does that mean we give up? No, you keep pushing on. We should be able to have discussions about vulnerabilities. But you as the researcher also have a responsibility to write it up as comprehensive as you can. So now you've sent the vulnerability report to the MDN. Now, sometimes this is where the process absolutely stops. Communication is set down and legal teams are called. I had this experience three years ago. We kept working at it for three years. And we are now successfully finally working together as a team rather than as adversaries. This is something that the community is actively working on. But now we've seen that sometimes it doesn't work out and it stops right there and the process doesn't progress anymore. But now once you've sent your vulnerability report to the medical, medical manufacturer, what happens next? Well, sometimes it gets filled in a drawer, joking, joking. No, they need to confirm your findings. They can't just accept and say that, yes, this is indeed correct. Unless your report is very comprehensive and very scientific, they will need to confirm this vulnerability for themselves. They would need to confirm whether they are even vulnerable to this or the way that they've implemented the, the flaw that was raised is indeed a problem. Again, throughout this process, you'll see that a lot of risk assessment is done. Decisions are made. Okay. Now, once we've confirmed the vulnerability, well, we need to identify the impact. Now, in manufacturing, there is a bill of materials, there's an S-bomb, a C-bomb. There are all these things. They are ideally asset tracking. You need to know what goes into the device that you are building. You need to track your fleet. You need to know what you have and where you have it implemented. Because heaven forbid you are faced with a vulnerability that you have confirmed but you do not know which devices are impacted. These are responsibilities and ownership that medical manufacturers need to take on themselves. This is not a process that anyone can do for them. In terms of dealing with flaws, asset management is a success for fast identification of flaws within your fleet. Now, we have identified that there's an impact to the devices we have. But now we need to do that very big thing that no one likes to do. We need to assess the risk. Not only the risk to fixing, the risk to not fixing, the risk of leaving this in. Dealing with vulnerabilities is as much a technical thing as it is a risk assessment, a risk acceptance. It is all about what is your appetite as an organizational manufacturer in terms of the risk. Once you've identified and completed your risk analysis portion, you will move on to actually deciding whether or not you will issue the fix or recall the device. Now, there are two options here. You can try and fix the problem, and sometimes it is just slapping a Band-Aid onto a bigger problem and you end up not being able to fix it. Or you have the flip side, where you do fix it and you inevitably break the device and it ends up in a recall. Now I'm going to give you this example. I had an issue with my firmware, which we managed to successfully fix. 
And if you've ever done a firmware update, you know that you pray from the start until it's completed. Because inevitably it might break. But there's a bit more at risk here. The fact is this device is within someone. So we need to identify and do risk analysis to determine whether or not fixing the device or fixing the flaw inevitably might take away the functionality of the device. It might break it, it might break it. It might introduce other vulnerabilities. When I made the decision in January to go back to a previous version of a device, I knew that there was vulnerabilities within the device. But again, I had to choose between functionalities and vulnerabilities. And I chose the functionality of it because I wanted to live. I was going through physical surgery. I wanted to be sure that the device that I got was the one that was functionally and clinically the perfect one for me. Unfortunately, there was a vulnerability. It's not necessarily an exploitable one. Not today, that is. But I had to take that risk mitigating decision. Do I try a new device that might not be functionally perfect for me? Or do I embrace the vulnerability of my device and let the functionalities outweigh the vulnerable portion of it? I did. And I can tell you that having quality of life back versus having this uber secure device that's not clinically perfect for me was an easy decision as a patient. Unfortunately, most patients are not my age. They're much older. And this is why it's so important that we take on board that dealing with vulnerabilities of embedded devices is not a paper-based exercise. There is a human being that might need to go in for painful, unpleasant surgery. I wanted to show you the pictures of my experience because it made me realize that having surgery was not easy. The longer you have your device, the worse it becomes and harder it becomes to remove it. And then in the final portion of dealing with it, once we've decided whether we can issue the fix, now we need to get the patients to come in so that we can introduce the fix. This is not something that you can do automatically or push over the wire. This is something that needs to be done in a controlled environment. Again, updating and dealing with vulnerabilities in devices which is not implanted in a patient is much easier than dealing with patients that have devices implanted. Now I've highlighted the process to you. So how do we make it move faster? Because if you think about it, some of the functional testing can take weeks if you have many variables that it have to run through. As a researcher, when you're doing a vulnerability disclosure, try and be comprehensive with your findings. Put examples, put the code you used, put as much information that you can to make the MDMs take note. Our medical manufacturers are trying to change the conversation. Very slowly, but these are big organizations. They are big silos to break down. But if a medical manufacturer comes back with a negative response, you as a researcher need to push them further. You need to push them out of their comfort zone. You need to make them listen. I often said, why am I the only one shouting the loudest in the room about this? And you know what? Three years later, it's paid off. It was not easy. It wasn't pleasant. I'm pretty sure I got called names behind my back. But I have a device. I want to build them better. I am so tired of having to hear that I cannot have something because we didn't build it that way. I want to build this in. How are we going to deal with vulnerabilities? Well, we are going to deal with it by building in the capacity to deal with them. Meaning we have to start developing and building for the future. We need to anticipate what may become vulnerable. When we are dealing with vulnerabilities, we need to be better at identifying the impact. 
An MDM needs to have their asset management on point. This is something that is your responsibility. It's not anyone else's. Make sure you know what goes into your product. When we do risk analysis, don't just look at the paper. Consider the perspective of the patient. When you decide to do a RAMware or a software fix, make sure that you've tested it comprehensively. Don't rush to a fix because you're afraid someone's going to point the finger because you've taken the extra time to properly test it. You cannot fail at this portion. You need to be successful in whatever you decide to implement. And you don't have to fix it all. Sometimes a bug doesn't need to be fixed. Sometimes, heaven forbid, a vulnerability doesn't need to be fixed. Sometimes we need to outweigh the fix versus what it might introduce. The last thing you want is to do a minor fix now. In a couple of years, there's a major fix that has to be done and the CPU cycles aren't available for that. Then we inevitably end up in surgery for a patient. If you choose to recall a device, you should be sure that you are willing to put a patient through surgery. Again, I often feel implanted devices are forgotten. I feel like it's something, it's the, it's the ginger stepchild of the medical device world. But it is the coolest device there is. Except a friend of mine would say electronic health records are. But we all have our poison. And I find the way that these things are built magnificently beautiful. But we need to take on board that we will deal with vulnerabilities. We will deal with devices that break. This is often all technology. And this is not something you can switch on and off and hope it works again.